and all the people watching at home right now with preschoolers are getting off their couch and clapping their hands. They're so excited. Willowbrook will be open for kids. And at some point, I think this week, we'll put that on Facebook. When you see it on the Willowbrook Facebook page, you ought to share it so we can get the word out and let people know they can come to church. A lot of people want to go to church. They stop me on the street and say, can I come to your church? I'm not a member. My church isn't open. I want to go to church. I said, sure, come to church. We're not trying to steal anyone's members, but we need to be in church. Uh, would you agree? And you heard John praying about it earlier. At least in Alabama, our governor says, you know, this is essential. Well, we knew that already, but there are places like California where there are pastors who may get arrested today. There's a, one pastor I know of in particular who the, the, a judge told him, if you meet on Sunday, you'll be arrested. And the first thousand people who show up will be receiving a citation. There are people like John MacArthur, who you may read his commentaries. He's 81 years old, and he's opening his church and may get thrown in prison in America for worshiping God. And these are churches who have had the same experience that we have had, having been open. It's safe. Not a single person has gotten sick because they came to our church. Uh, it's a wonderful, safe experience. Now, if you're watching at home right now and you are compromised in any way, shape, or form, if you are a higher-risk individual, stay home. Don't come to church. Stay home. I want to make sure that you're safe and we'll continue a real quality live stream. But for everyone else, come on back. Now, quickly, let me say this uh, to our traditional venue Obviously, for the kids to meet in the venue, the traditions venue, will have to hit the pause button. I just want you to hear me say again how much we value uh, the, the worship experience in the, the venue. I was in there just a moment ago, and I could hear the worship, and it, it's, it's special. It's great. And this is only temporary. It's only temporary. The coronavirus will not last forever. My suggestion is for those of you in the venue who uh, need to find a, a new place to worship, 8 o'clock service is a mask-only service, just like the venue. So you may want to check out the 8 o'clock service. It's also traditional. Uh, you can, by all means, come in this room if you would like. We have a, a section over here that is uh, mask-only, uh, and, and there's a lot of room over there uh, right now. If you wanted to come, I promise you would be socially distanced in that section. So... Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Madison Campus, we love you guys so much. Glad that you are with us as well. Um, speaking of masks, is anybody besides me getting tired of wearing these things? No, we need to wear them for our safety and the safety of others, but I'm so tired of it. I, I went to pick up my wife at the Huntsville Airport, and I forgot to put it on. And people kept giving me this ugly, nasty look, and I just I didn't remember. I made it all the way up to the security check-in, because I like to like park the car and welcome her home. And, and I couldn't figure out why people kept looking at me like they were until finally someone said something. Oh, my mask. I, I was walk, walking back to the car with my shirt over my nose. Uh, I had to throw away a mask this week because it stunk. I never thought I had an issue with halitosis. Maybe I do. It kind of, Jan said, Mark, you could have washed it. We didn't have to throw it away. But, but Whitney Reeves shared with, speaking of masks, shared with me that maybe this is proof of evolution. The picture of the average man in 2019 looked like that. This year looks like this. Next year? <laughs> I hope these masks are not deforming our ears. I hope, I hope. <laughs> uh, but it's important for a time, and we will wear them to, to keep people safe. Uh, so glad you're here, Madison venue, this room, online, wherever you may be. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 13. If you're a regular, you know we're reading through the New Testament as a church in 2020. We read five chapters a week, and then on Sundays I will preach one of the chapters you read during the previous week, which means this week I should be somewhere in 2 Corinthians chapters 2 to 6. But instead, we're going to be back in 1 Corinthians 13, where we were last week. I intended only to preach the one sermon, then realized it was going to turn into two. It may end up being three. And part of that is just because I'm trying to keep it short, trying to keep the messages shorter, because we're going to keep 60 minutes, 60 minutes only for your kids when they're worshiping, and we need time to disinfect all the chairs between services. But the, the biggest reason I'm spending a little time here is just because we need it. 
We're living in a world that desperately needs the love of Jesus Christ. There is more conflict, more hate and unrest in our nation than I have ever seen in my life. We need a message on love. So kids, you start school next week, or well, kind of, virtually. You excited? Uh, deafening silence. Um, and do you remember, speaking of school, when, when I remember doing this, uh, but I'm old, do you remember hearing tests in school? I think they quit in Alabama maybe in 2015. I, I read about a hearing test, this is long before, that Mary Ann Bird experienced. She called it the whisper test. And I read her story. She, she, in her autobiography, she talks about how she grew up knowing she was different. You see, Mary Ann had a cleft palate. And she was born that way, and there was not a surgeon around who could fix it. She, she was loved and supported by her family, and she knew that. But when she started school, the kids made fun of her cleft palate. She was the little girl with the mishappened lip, the crooked nose, the lopsided teeth, and, and the garbled speech. Whenever a, a classmate would ask, how did that happen? She, she would typically say, oh, I fell down and cut myself on a piece of glass. Somehow it seemed more acceptable to her if it happened by accident instead of being born that way. She was convinced no one outside of her family could ever love her until second grade. Second grade, she said, we had a teacher named Mrs. Leonard, and everyone adored her. She was a short, round, happy, sparkling woman. Every year we would have a, a hearing test, and <clears throat> she called it the whisper test. Uh, the teacher would have the kids stand at the door across the room, and she would be at her desk, and then she would whisper something, and the children would have to to you know, repeat back what the teacher had whispered, covering one ear and, and then the other. I know it seems like a primitive method to, to do a hearing test, but that's how it was done at the time. And so the students would be at the door, and the teacher would whisper, the sky is blue. And the student would have to repeat, the sky is blue. I have new shoes. She just made up different sentences, and they would repeat. Uh, Mary Ann Bird said, then it was my turn. And I waited for the teacher to speak, words that God himself must have put in her heart. Mrs. Leonard looked at me, and she whispered, I wish you were my little girl. She said, those seven words changed my life. That's love. That's agape. That's what happened at the cross, even though we were deformed by sin. From the cross, God was whispering, I wish you were my little girl. I wish you were my little boy. I wish you were my child. And so to make that happen, I'm going to send my only begotten son who will sacrifice himself on a cross that you might become a child of God. That is love. That is agape. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is, is all about. Your sermon title, it's agape. Uh, an unbeliever might have thought the sermon title was agape. No, it's not agape. It is a Greek word, agape. In the English, we just have one word for love. But in the Greek, there were four different words to describe four different types of love. I'll share them with you quickly. There was the Greek word storge. Storge was a family love, maybe the love between a parent and a child. Then there's the Greek word eros. We get the word erotic from eros. It was a romantic love. You only see that in the New Testament one time. Then there's the Greek word phileo. Phileo was a brotherly love. You heard of Philadelphia? It's named after that Greek word. It's the city of brotherly love. And finally, the highest form of biblical love is agape. It is the word we see throughout 1 Corinthians 13. Agape is unselfish, sacrificial, divine love. That's the love we need. That's the love our country needs. Because America is a bit of a mess right now. And the problems facing us are so deep, so dark, that the only real answer is Jesus Christ. We need a revival. And here's how it happens. If, if people will begin to turn them, their lives over to Christ, then they will start to exercise agape love with one another. And then our society will change. We hear so much about racism, and it's wrong, and it's evil in any form. But, but, our, but, but the issue is not 
it's not a skin issue. It's a sin issue. It's a heart issue. And the only person who can deal with the heart is Jesus Christ. And so do everything we can possibly do to, to, to bring about change. But we don't need more legislation. We don't need more politicians. We don't need more social media posts. We don't need more hashtag this or hashtag that. What we need is more love. And when there are more people who are following Christ, then more people will love as he loved. And then our world, our society will be transformed. But it starts with Jesus. America needs Jesus. And then we will find the unity. Then we will find what we're looking for. Because you follow Christ. You love as he loved. That's why I'm taking a minute with this chapter. Or a week or two or three. Sometimes I'll take big chunks of scripture. And then other times we study it word by word. Which is what we have been doing. So uh, let, let's um, catch up. Chapter 13 starting in verse 1. Uh, let's read together, and I'll give you, by review, the points we've already, already covered. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. By way of review, last week, first point, first quality of love we said was, number one, love is superior to gifts. And I'll give you number two and three. Love is patient. Love is kind. And now we begin with new material. Point number four, love is not envious. Jot that down and then read with me in verse four. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. There it is. It does not envy. Love is not envious. This is the first of eight uh, uh, negative descriptions uh, of love that we see in the passage. Love is not envious. Love and envy are mutually exclusive. The Greek word here is actually zelo and could be translated jealous or envious. And some Bibles translate it jealous either is acceptable real love is not jealous it's not envious proverbs 14:30 says envy rots the bones it is not good for you it will rot your bones shakespeare called envy the green sickness it'll make you sick it will rot your bones it will steal your joy what else does the word of god say proverbs 27 verse 4 who can stand before jealousy. Uh, James 3.16, where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. What does God think about envy? He calls it evil. He says it is wicked. He says no one can stand before jealousy. God must be pretty serious about this when he calls it evil. It's, so, you ever struggle with, with, with envy, with jealousy? Someone gets a, a new car and you wish you had it and you get jealous. Someone's house is bigger than your house and so you become envious. Someone possesses something that you don't possess. You wish it was yours so you get eaten up by that green sickness called envy. And maybe you envy their possession. Maybe you envy the vacation they just went on. Maybe you envy a position. They got the promotion instead of you. You're just as smart as they are. No, I'm smarter than they are. And I've been at the company longer. And I work harder. It's not fair. You, you can envy many different things. It could be a possession. It could be a position. It could be the praise of others. Why don't people praise me like they praise him? Why don't I have as many friends as her? They have it, you want it, so you're jealous. Don't you know there's always going to be somebody with something better or cooler or, or newer? Why not rejoice for them instead of being jealous of them? Re uh, Romans 12 verse 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. But here's something I've discovered over the years. It's a lot easier to find someone who will weep with you when you're weeping than someone who will rejoice with you when you are rejoicing. People are jealous. Jan was on the phone, and, and when she hung up, she looked at me, and she said, Now, that's a true friend. I said, What do you mean? It sounded like a normal conversation to me. She said, She's one of the few people who will really rejoice with me 
when something good happens in my life. I promise you can find 20 people who will sit down and weep with you when something bad happens to you for every one person who will genuinely rejoice when something good happens in your life. They rejoice for you instead of being jealous of you. I wish that happened to me. When you find a person who loves you like that, cherish them because you have just found a true friend. Love is not envious, number four. Number five, love is not boastful or proud. We see that at the very end of verse 4. It does not boast. It is not proud. We're going to treat both of these together as one point. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. The Greek word for proud could be translated puffed up or inflated. Do you know anyone like that? They take every opportunity they can to puff themselves up to inflate themselves. Oh, look at me. Oh, look how wonderful I am. I'm telling you, there's no room for pride and love in the same human heart. In Proverbs 18, 13, God says, pride and arrogance, I hate. Wow. If God says he hates something, I'd pay really close attention. God says, I hate pride. Pride is what cast Lucifer out of heaven. You don't want to have anything in your life that resembles Lucifer. Love is not arrogant. Love does not boast. In verse 4, the word boast is in the Greek is not used anywhere else in the New Testament, just here. The, the word could be translated to talk conceitedly, to put on a show, to parade around your imagined superiority. Real love never shows off, doesn't boast, doesn't brag. Really, bragging is kind of the opposite side of jealousy. Jealousy says, I want what you have. Bragging says, I want you to be jealous of what I have. And so you boast, you inflate, you puff up. Only problem is, in an effort to build yourself up, what often happens is you end up tearing everybody else down. Have you ever been crabbing in the ocean? Nobody in two surfaces. Well, it's boring, don't go, but I, I grew up in, in Houston, Texas. It was close to Galveston, Freeport. We could get to the coast in under an hour. My dad used to take me fishing for speckled trout, redfish, flounder, a lot of fun fishing. But one day I was at my friend Milton's beach house. His family had a house on the bay, and his mother said, let's go crabbing. I'd never done it. Let's go. I like anything in the ocean except crabbing. Like I said, it's boring. So we get on a pier, and we have these strings, and she tied chicken next to the string, and we drop the string in the water, and we stand there and hold it. And you wait to feel weight on the string, and then slowly you would pull the string up, and you'd have a crab hanging on to the chicken neck. And we'd throw the crab in the crab basket, and you know, we did it for hours. And after we had a few crabs, I, I, I said, where's the lid? There's no lid on the crab basket. She said, we, we don't need a lid. Used to have one, lost it. But, but Mrs. Howard, we need a lid. The, the crabs are going to escape, and I've been out here for hours. I don't want to lose any of these crabs. I want to eat them. She said, they won't get out. Yes, they will. They will escape. She says, no, they won't, and this is the reason why. When one crab starts trying to crawl its way to freedom, the other crabs reach up and pull it back down. I've had some crabs in my life. How about you? Maybe you're married to a crab. Maybe you work for a crab. People who always pull you down. They never lift you up. They never encourage. You, you try to go higher. They always pull you down down. Have you ever been telling a story and you can tell the person's not even listening? They're, they're listening, but really in their own mind, they're formulating the story they're going to tell whenever you finally finish. And their story will be bigger and grander and much more brilliant than your pitiful, lame little story. And so finally you finish, oh yeah, yeah, that's a good story. But let me tell you what happened to me. Blowing out someone else's candle does not make yours burn any brighter. And can I just give you a, 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 little, a little help if you're trying to make friends? No one wants to be around braggadocious, know-it-all, crabby people flaunting their self-perceived importance. Nobody. You want to brag? Paul tells you how to brag. In Galatians 6.14, Paul says, May it never be that I should boast, except 
in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to brag? Brag on Jesus. Number six. Number six. Love is nice. Love is nice. We see this in verse 5 where I read, it does not, love does not dishonor others. I read a lot of different translations. It seems as though everyone translates this first phrase a little bit differently. Here's a few of the ones I've read. Love does not dishonor others. Love does not act unbecomingly. Love does not behave unseemly, does not behave indecently. Love is not ill-mannered. Love is not rude. So I take all of those and kind of put them together. I think you can summarize it by saying love is nice. We could use some more nice in America, would you agree? We could use more nice in politics, would you agree? You hear how Donald Trump and Joe Biden talk about each other? Not nice. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and Donald Trump, they're so nice when they talk about one another, aren't they? Not at all. You know who one of my favorite presidents of all time was? Abraham Lincoln. Great leader, great president. God used him to end slavery. But it may surprise you, even the great Abraham Lincoln was criticized during his entire time in public office. One of his biggest critics was a man by the name of Edwin Stanton. He actually ran against Lincoln in, in several elections. He publicly criticized Lincoln. Publicly, he made fun of how he looked. He said, Lincoln is a silly-looking clown. He said, Abraham Lincoln is the original gorilla. He was famous for saying, you don't have to go to Africa to see a gorilla. Just look at Abraham Lincoln. But Lincoln never retaliated. He never sent out an, uh, a, a mean tweet. He, he never said an unkind word. Ever. Later, Abraham Lincoln was elected president, and he was looking for someone to become the Secretary of War. That's what it was called back then. And when he selected a person, he selected Edwin Stanton, his critic. And people asked him, how in the world could you choose that man who has been so critical of you? Lincoln said, I just believe he's the best man for the job. Could have exacted vengeance, could have retaliated, but instead Abraham Lincoln was nice. After he was assassinated, Edwin Stanton was filing by his coffin, and he paused at the coffin, and he said, there lies the greatest ruler of men the world has ever seen. He was patient. He was kind. He was nice. We could use more nice in our country. Amen? Love is nice. Number seven, love is unselfish. If you're taking notes, love is unselfish. Still in verse five, it's, we read, it is not self-seeking. Uh, one translation reads, love does not insist on its own way. Another reads, love isn't always me first. That's the problem in most relationships, I think. Whether it's a, a marriage or a friendship, we enter the relationship me first instead of, instead of you first. Uh, if, if you can find it, flip over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. The longer God leaves me on this planet, the more I realize there's only one thing that really matters in life. Others, putting other people first, meeting other people's needs. In your relationships, you need to ask yourself, is it me first or is it others first? Look at this passage, this famous passage in Philippians chapter 2. Start reading with me in verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Others come first. Value others above yourself. Verse 4, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of what? Say the word out loud. Of, of others. It's all about others. Put others first. Verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So 
he, he's telling us others, others, others. It's all about others. Love is not selfish. It's not me first. It's others first. And then he get, tells us in verse 5, I just want you to be like Jesus. And what was Jesus like? Was he other-centered? Keep reading. Verse 6. Who, in, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Verse 6. Who being in the very nature God. If you read that in the Greek, it says being in the very form of of God. He emptied himself. Verse 7, he made himself nothing. It literally reads, he emptied himself. Emptied himself of what? Emptied himself of his divine nature? No, a thousand times no. That's what a liberal will try to tell you, that he gave up his divinity in order to pick up humanity. The word for, the word form in verse 6 it is the word morphe in the Greek. It's a word that form that never changes. The word schema in the Greek is a form that continuously changes. That's not the word used here. It is the word morphe, a form that never changes. He did not give up his divinity. He held on to his divinity and at the same time picked up humanity. Verse 7, he made himself nothing. Talk about other-centered. You could literally read he emptied himself. He left heaven to come to a smelly stable. A more lowly place of birth could not have possibly existed. He exchanged a throne in heaven for a manger. Worshiping angels were replaced with kind but bewildered shepherds. The creator of life himself was created. God came to earth wrapped in swaddling clothes in the form of a baby. That's other-centered. And then what did he do? He took the very nature of a servant made in human likeness, verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. It wasn't enough that he, that he came, but he gave. He went to a cross. He suffered and bled and died for you and me, other centered. What does love look like? What does it mean to be unselfish? It looks like that. Verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Under the earth. And we're talking the devil and his demonic imps. One day their knees will bow and their tongue, verse 11, will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's love. That's unselfish. That's being other-centered. In your relationships, are you me first, me first, me first, or others first? How about your marriage? Jan and I don't have the perfect marriage, but we have a really good marriage. We, on Tuesday, we will have been married for 36 years. And I think uh, a lot of that, it, we got married when we were 10, 20, actually 20. She was 20. We were young. Quit doing the math. I know I'm old. But I think part of what's helped us have a, a healthy marriage is just we've always tried to meet one another's needs. I'll give you an example. Years ago, I noticed that for breakfast, Jan was eating peanut butter crackers, and sometimes she'd skip breakfast altogether. And I thought, well, that's not healthy. So I decided I would be unselfish. I would be others first, Jan first. And I started cooking her a hot breakfast every morning. I've done it for years. Eggs, bacon, on, on special occasions, hash browns. Now, I do separate eggs because I, my eggs, I put, every, I put everything but the kitchen sink in my eggs. I put Kalamata olives in my eggs, bell pepper, a lot of jalapeno. Uh, if we had pizza the night before and have leftovers, I'll take all the toppings off the leftover of the pizza and put that in my eggs. If we had tacos the night before, taco meat. Taco meat's great in eggs. Everything's good in eggs. But no, no, Jan doesn't like all that stuff, so I, I bought a special skillet. She has her own skillet. And so I'm like the, the, the omelet station cook at your favorite resort. I've got her own little egg thing working. One day it's an omelet. The next day it's scrambled with cheese. The next day it's an egg fritter. I felt sorry for the poor thing eating peanut butter crackers. Even after all these years, she rarely finishes her eggs poor thing eats like a bird. No, that's why she's so skinny, I guess. Well, recently, I caught my wife giving eggs to the dogs. 
What are you doing? That's good stuff. After all these years of me cooking her a hot breakfast, she confessed. Mark, really don't like eggs. Well, my mother used to make me eat them when I was a kid, and I would hold my nose with each bite. It, it, it feels like taking medicine. Taking medicine all these years. I thought I was meeting her needs, being a great blessing. In reality, it was like I was giving her medicine. But, but this is love. This, this is marriage. <laughs> I'm putting her first, cooking for my wife, meeting what I thought was her need. She's putting me first by not telling me she can't stand this stuff that I'm making because she doesn't want to hurt my feelings. And so it's worked for 36 years because we keep putting one another first. At times, maybe we ought to communicate better, like with this. But if you would just put others first in your relationships, it would make such a difference. Well, Pastor Mark, it's easy to be unselfish when it's someone you love like your spouse. What if it's a total stranger? It's different. Okay, it might be different, but not impossible. Let me give you an example. Do you know Jason and Heather? Jason and Heather Elmer have been members of our church for a very long time. Here's a picture of their happy family. Look at that shirt. It's the great virtual race across Tennessee, 1,000 1, kilometers. He's very fit. He ran a 636-mile virtual race, took a couple of months to do it. Uh, very, very healthy physically, very healthy spiritually. Jason Elmer is a godly man. He's been with me to Haiti on a mission trip. I have watched him love those Haitian orphan kids. He's a godly man. Recently, this year, he discovered that a good friend of the family named Courtney was dying. Courtney was just 26 years old. She had her whole life ahead of her, but, but her kidneys were shutting down. Her kidneys were only functioning at 6%. Basically, they were shriveling up. If Courtney did not get a kidney transplant, she would die. Her blood type was O positive, and so Jason felt like God was telling him, you need to get tested and find out if you're a match. So he got himself tested, and, and he was. He was a match, and he was prepared to donate a kidney to save their friend, Courtney. But instead, Courtney, she needed it so quickly that her mother, who was also a match, donated her kidney. And Courtney, she had the surgery. She's doing well. She's living in Phoenix, Arizona right now, doing great. But after this experience where Jason almost donated a kidney, he, he discovered that there are a lot of people in America who are dependent on dialysis just to live. There are people dying simply because there are not enough people willing to donate a kidney. And so he began to research, and he, he discovered you can live with just one kidney. You might have to change your eating habits some. You, you might not have as long as a lifespan. You, you, you may, but you may not because your one remaining kidney has to work a little bit harder. But, but, but really, isn't that a small price to pay if you could save a life? So Jason decided to donate a kidney to someone in need, not for Courtney, but for a total stranger. I asked Jason why. And he quoted to me Luke 3.11, where John the Baptist said, Anyone who has two tunics should share with the person who has none. Jason said, I have two kidneys. Shouldn't I share if I could save a life? So three weeks ago, Jason flew to Mayo Clinic, and he had surgery where, where they removed one of his healthy kidneys. They flew that kidney across the country to Rochester, Minnesota, where a person that Jason has never met or even spoken to had their life saved by his kidney because he was willing to give. I talked to Jason on the phone last week, and he said, uh, he said one day, I, I hope I can meet this person. I just want to tell them why. If I don't meet them, it's okay, but I hope I can so I can tell them why I did it. I'll tell them that we're Christians. And we're supposed to love one another. So Jason loved someone he's never seen or, or even met because that's agape. That's what real love does. It is unselfish. Biblical love gives. Biblical love puts other people first. Whether it is your spouse or whether it is a total stranger, if you want to be like Christ who gave it all, left heaven to come to earth so that you and I might have life, if you want to be like Jesus, 
it'll be others first instead of me first. I've already kind of promised we're going to do another week in this chapter, so I don't need to rush myself through another point. And we need to give guys time to sanitize seats. So bow your heads with me and let's, let's, let's close it down. Father God, thank you for showing us what love looks like. Jason Elmer is a great example, but I'm thinking about you, Lord Jesus. You gave not just a part of your body to save a life. You gave your whole life. You died on a cross so that all of us might have life eternal and life abundant. From the cross, you were shouting, I love you, I love you, I love you. Help us to be more like you, Lord Jesus. And right now, as we wrap up a service, I pray that your spirit will move in power, draw people to yourself, do what only you can do, save souls and change lives. In Jesus' name, amen.